Hey, welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm J.B. Shreve, your host at the Faithful Considerations Podcast, and we are at episode three of our Days of David podcast series. And today, I'm really excited about this one. We're going to look at the rise of Saul, King Saul. For those reading along with us and utilizing this podcast series as a supplement for your own study of First and Second Samuel, most of the events we cover in today's episode take place in First Samuel chapters 8 to 11. We'll also be digging around a little bit in Judges chapters 19 to 21. A lot of you probably know the story of Saul already. This is the guy, the first king of Israel, who came to the throne with such prominence. But then he literally goes mad. He moves from hero to villain, and we'll see that over the arc of the next few episodes here. If you don't know the story of Saul, I encourage you to read those chapters in 1 Samuel even before jumping into this podcast episode. Then read it again afterward to see what pieces come to light for you in a new way. As always, if you're enjoying this podcast series, please help us get the word out by sharing it with your friends on your social media feeds and all of that good stuff. Outside of that, let's go ahead and jump into episode number three in our Days of David podcast series, The Rise of Saul. Now, we've already talked in this series about the setting of the book of Judges and an era when everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's a phrase that should be familiar with to you after episode one. I'm not necessarily going to go back through that, that part of the book of Judges, but as we get into today's story, I think it's a good idea to look at one particular episode, one particular event captured near the end of the book of Judges. Now, I got to warn you. This is R-rated stuff here, but it's right out of the Bible. So I, I guess brace yourself. Um, if you're listening to this in the car with your kids, just be aware. I'm not going to cut a lot of corners here. Um, I'm not going to add to it, but it is R-rated stuff from the book of Judges. This story is actually part of the final sequence of stories in that book, where a lot of the chapters with that phrase, in those days there was no king of Israel. They A lot of the chapters start with that phrase in this sequence of event events in the book of Judges. It picks up in chapter 20 of Judges with this strange little tale of an unnamed Levite who lived in a remote part of the land of Ephraim. Now, the Levite, this unnamed Levite, he takes a woman as a concubine. Now, a concubine, uh, it's, it's an unseemly figure in parts of the Old Testament. Not a prostitute, not a wife, somewhere in the middle between those two things. I, I think of them kind of like a member of a harem. When I, when I see the word concubine or see the identity or person of a concubine in these stories, sometimes there were kings who had wives, but they also had concubines. And unfortunately, we're going to run into the figure of concubines a lot in our Days of David series. So the Levite has this concubine. She's also unnamed, by the way. And the book of Judges says she was unfaithful to him. A little bit of a double standard there, but okay. She leaves the Levite and she goes and lives at her father's house in the land of Judah, specifically in the land of Bethlehem. After a while, the Levite, he goes to woo her back, all right? He has some success at this, but he's delayed in returning home. When he finally gets her to leave with him, leave her father's house, come back home with him, he leaves with his concubine and he travels late into the evening one night into the land of Benjamin, specifically the little town known as Gibeah. Now, this is, an import, this is not important yet, but later, when we get to the story of King Saul, keep in mind, this is where he was from, the town of Gibeah, all right? Anyway, so we get to Gibeah, and the, the Levite and his concubine, they find a place, or they can't find a place to stay, so he and she fall asleep in the town square. Well, a local resident of the town comes in from the fields and asks, why are they staying there? The Levite explains, and the friendly man invites them to his house. Now... The rest of the story, this is where it gets pretty dark. And it's really interesting, nearly parallel to the story of the heavenly visitors who met with Lot on the night before Sodom was destroyed. Remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, the man and his concubine go to their host house and they're having dinner. But soon that house is surrounded by townspeople who demand their neighbor turn over this visitor so they can have sex with them. I told you it's going to get bad, all right? The host refuses, and to save his own life, this Levite 
pushes his concubine out the door to the mercy of the mob. They abuse her all night until she finally dies. The next morning, the Levite puts the concubine's dead body on his donkey and he heads home. When he gets home, rather than burying her, he cuts the woman's body into 12 pieces and sends one piece of the body along with the story of what happened to every tribe in Israel. Gruesome stuff, right? This is Judges 19, verses 30. It says, And so it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. Well, they do. And the nation of Israel, all the tribes, unite as one, and they go to war against the tribe of Benjamin over this outrage. The people of the tribe of Benjamin held their own for a little while, but eventually they're defeated, darn near annihilated, in fact. Israel destroyed the cities of Benjamin, their buildings. Almost every male in the land is wiped out. So when we come to chapter 21 of the book of Judges, the final chapter, there's mourning for the tribe of Benjamin because it appears that this brief but destructive civil war has destroyed nearly a whole tribe from among the people of God. There's no women left among the lands of Benjamin. Eventually, they find a solution and send the last remaining remnant of Benjamin, or send to the last remaining remnant of Benjamin, all the women from the town of Jabesh Gilead. The young women are taken from their home and given to the Benjamites, and the tribe is saved. Now, again, keep that town's name in mind too, Jabesh Gilead. Keep that in mind. It's important later in the story. So, why am I sharing this weird obscure story from the end of the book of Judges right here in our story of the days of David. Well, there's a couple of reasons. First, I want to remind you about the dark times that these people are living in here. As we come to the story of Saul, Israel's first king, it's important to remember that. This is the the backdrop. This is the darkness of the age that these folks are living in. So as we come to Saul, it's important to remember that he was from the tribe of Benjamin. The scars, this tribe that's almost been wiped out, the scars, the the trauma of this civil war, it would have been inherent to his tribal, his individual identity. I was raised up in the American South. 130 years after the Civil War, there was still, when I was growing up, there was still this sense of offense, of sensitivity among Southerners toward Northerners regarding that war. There's likely a lot of places in the world like that today. An affront or a defeat from generations ago still lingers in the bloodline of the descendants who saw or who never saw the actual fighting. Well, how much more was that the case in Saul's lifetime? We have Benjamin, one of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, nearly eradicated in this civil war, nearly eradicated by his own cousins, brothers, among the other tribes of Israel. That's what Saul was born into. That sensitivity between the tribes of Benjamin and the other tribes of Israel, it's important to remember that when we get to the story of David and Saul. Later on in the podcast series, you're going to see this pop up. There's a a lot more tension under the surface than we catch on a normal superficial reading of 1 Samuel. David went to great pains to not offend the Benjamites, to not offend the rest of Israel, because after this civil war, the Benjamites especially were almighty sensitive some Jewish commentators even suggest that this story of the civil, civil war at the, the end of the book of Judges was highlighted by the proponents of David in later generations to show how wicked the tribe of Benjamin, Saul's tribe, had behaved. They were behaving like the people of Sodom, after all. Remember, that story almost parallels the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the visitors who came to visit Lot and his family. And it was David's tribe, Judah, that led the way against Benjamin in this civil war. You'll notice that when you read the story in the closing chapters of Judges. Now, I'm leery of getting too bogged down into that kind of thinking when I read the Bible. It is the inspired Word of God, after all. But when we look at the times, we we should recognize the political realities that we're dealing with. And as we come to the story of Saul, this is a big political reality. The nation's on edge. There's been a fresh trauma, and Benjamin is at the center of that trauma. The other tribes feel that they did what they had to. But at the same time, they're mournful of how weakened Benjamin has become. It's not clear where the the rise of Samuel fits in with all all of that. Likely he was born at a later date, separate 
uh, removed from the trauma of that civil war. When we last saw him in the previous episode, he had just delivered his first prophetic word to no other than his own mentor. And it was a doozy of a word, remember? The house of Eli collapses. Samuel ascends. He's the judge of Israel now. His authority and integrity triggers a sort of revival in the land. We read about this in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3 to 6. It says, Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, If you want to return to the Lord with all your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods and your images of Ashtoreth. That was a, an idol, a false god. Turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from the Philistines. So the Israelites got rid of their images of Baal and Ashtoreth and worshiped only the Lord. Then Samuel told them, gather all of the Israelites to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and in a great ceremony, drew water from a well and poured it out before the Lord. They also went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. It was at Mizpah that Samuel became Israel's judge. The era, era of Samuel's judge food, judgeship, it's official now. He's leading the nation. He even leads them in a victory against the Philistines a few verses after this. There's this period of about 20 years that go by under his leadership. But as steady as things are under Samuel, some of the elders of the tribes, they sense trouble on the horizon. They look ahead to the day when Samuel will eventually die. And what they forecast, well, it doesn't bode well. Samuel's married, he has sons, but they aren't like him. In fact, they have a bit of a reputation for being corrupt at times. They don't walk in the ways of Samuel. So that means the cycle of the judges is going to continue. If Samuel's descendants can't maintain his standard, then as soon as he's gone, as in the days of past judges, the status of Israel will decline. The oppressors, the invaders, they'll return. The quality of life will collapse and the people will be back to worse than they were before he arrived. And that's when the Israelites do a fateful thing. They come to Samuel, and in chapter 8, we read about the interaction. This is verses 4 to 5, 1 Samuel chapter 8. It says, Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. This is a pretty pivotal moment in the history of the nation. They've never done this before. There, there's a touch of sadness in the request itself. When they left Egypt, when they wandered in the wilderness, when they took the promised land, at no point did they ever have a king. God was their king. God pointed out how the other nations of the world would celebrate their acclaim and talk about how there was no other nation like this, a nation without a king, but to, to whom God himself was their king. He took a personal interest in their fate. He fought with them. He fought for them. But now Israel's saying, all that's fine and good, but we'll trade it for our own king. We no longer want to be special. We just want to be stable. We want to be like the other nations. Pretty radical, really, if you consider it. They aren't saying that specifically, but implicitly it's there. We don't want to be special. We can't be trusted to be special. We just want to be like everyone else. So the question that has to come to mind, especially since we know this request will eventually end up in the rise of David to the throne, was this something God wanted the people to ask? It doesn't seem like it, right? He had higher plans for the people, but they insisted on something less for themselves. The bottom line is that it was wrong to request it, or at least there was something in their heart that was wrong when they request, requested it. We can see that by Samuel's response in the next verse. He, it says, Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. God was supposed to be Israel's king. That was his plan. By saying they wanted a man to be their king, like all the other nations, they weren't only rejecting their destiny that God birthed this nation for, they're rejecting God himself here. At the same time, God wasn't surprised. He knew it would happen. Way back in the days of Moses, in the book of De Deuteronomy, we see God predicted this would happen. He gave prescriptions for what a king would, would be like and how he should behave once they asked for a king. This is Deuteronomy 17 verses uh, 14 and 15. It says, you're about to enter the land the Lord your God has given you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think, 
we should select a king to rule over us like all the other nations around us. If this happens, be sure to select a king as king, the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. So the request of these elders who came to Israel and asked for a king, it's almost verbatim to what God said they would do right there. So many generations back, all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, give us a king like the other nations around us. Some scholars think that this is exactly what they were doing. They were reading the words of Deuteronomy back to Samuel, standing on the authority, on the license of Scripture in that request. Honestly, it's not really clear why they waited till now, why they picked this moment to ask for a king. Some suggest that God never wanted Israel to have a king at all. I think that probably was the idea. He would be their king. He would rule over them. That was what God was after all along. Israel was a shadow of the kingdom of God that he birthed through Christ in the New Testament. But the kingdom of God is made up of people who are fueled by the grace of God, his energy. That empowers us to follow him. Before the age of grace, people were still bound to the flesh, wanting to do what was right, but still always doing what was wrong. This ancient people could never have followed God as king. The era of the judges proved that, if nothing else. The thing that displeased Samuel in this passage and reflected the displeasure of God was that they were rejecting Samuel. They saw him as getting too old. They didn't trust his sons. They they wanted to hold their destiny in their own hand. And that's why God counsels Samuel, they aren't rejecting you. Ultimately, they're rejecting me. And God directs Samuel, give them what they ask for. You want a king? I'm going to give you a king and all that comes with it. And that's why Samuel warns the people what will follow. This is chapter 8, verses 10 to 18 of 1 Samuel. It says, so Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops, and some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for them. He'll take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will make you, he will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding, but then the Lord will not help you. He's going to take advantage of you. He's going to take the strength from your homes and make it his own. You sure you're ready for this? Are you sure this is what you want? And the people respond with a resounding yes. Sounds like a great deal to us. Verse 19 to 22, but the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the other nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say, give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. And that's the platform upon which the monarchy of Israel is about to be established. Hey folks, quick break here in our episode. Now earlier in the episode, I mentioned this idea of being fueled by the grace of God. That's a a defining characteristic of the kingdom of God. Now, if that language is a little foreign to you, if it intrigues you, if the thought intrigues you, I want to encourage you to look at another series we did here at the Faithful Considerations podcast. It's called Grace, the Energy of God. That series was produced earlier this year in 2023, and you can find it at the website or on Spotify or wherever you download your favorite podcast. If it's been put into the archives, if you go to the website, and I don't know when you're listening to this episode, but if you go to the archives and you find that one's already been put away, and after some time it will be put away uh, off of the regular podcast fees, you can still access that podcast series when you're a Patreon supporter of the podcast. So for as little as a dollar a month, you can help support the podcast and help us get more of these kinds of episodes and series out there. So check that out at patreon.com backslash JB Shreve. That's patreon.com backslash JB Shreve. And you can also find links to that same same page at jbshreve.com. Check it out today, and I think that'll do it. Let's go back to the episode. And now we come to the story of Saul. Now, 
we have to understand Saul to fully appreciate David. The story of Saul, the first king of Israel, is everything that David was not. And David was all that Saul was not. And that's why Saul has to be replaced ultimately. It's actually a really tragic story, but it's also probably a story more of us share personal familiarity with than we realize. A lot of us have known people like Saul, the good, the bad, and the fatally flawed. For me, there's this small handful of men who stand as Saul-like icons in my life, and they're, they're flashing signals of warning. Deal with your stuff. The only thing the enemy likes better than stopping us from ever finding and seeing God is to take us after we've seen him, and in our crashing fall, we run the risk of taking the whole world down that found God through us. Saul wasn't a bad man. He didn't start out that way anyway. He was a flawed one, for sure, but those flaws were below the surface. The problem was he had an ability to keep the flaws hidden below the surface. So that meant he could go without ever really having to deal with his issues, ever really addressing them. And because he wouldn't deal with those internal flaws, they ultimately served as the foothold for darkness to enter his life and ruin him and cause immeasurable trauma to the kingdom that he was called to rule over. Saul's the story of a man called, but a destiny lost. It's the story of a good man and then his moral and spiritual collapse. It's the story of a man who moved beyond the bounds and hope of repentance and returning to God. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament, it talks about this kind of person. Hebrews 6 verses 4 to 6, this is the New Living Translation. It says, For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It's impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. When I was a young man and I first read those words, they stood out as a challenge to me. Never go back. Never give up. Never betray the grace that God has given me a taste of. And as I became an older man, as life and experience led me on different pathways, I met a few, not many, but a few men who walked that pathway. And now those words, they're almost haunting. We use the phrase, but for the grace of God go I, too lightly, I think. I've met good, strong men, men who were stronger than me, more gifted. Some of them were men I followed, and some were men I had to choose to run away from. But they fit that description there. They were the Sauls in my life. Saul started out good. Remember that. It wasn't Samuel that picked Saul. It was God that picked him. It wasn't Samuel who ends up rejecting Saul. It was God. And it was Saul's refusal to deal with those secret inner flaws and cracks and fractures in his own heart that delivered him to his terrible, his miserable fate. When we first meet him, when we first meet Saul, we're immediately told about how exceptional he was as a man in Israel and among the tribe of Benjamin. This is 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 to 2. There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Aphia of the tribe of Benjamin. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. This may seem like a superficial and insignificant verse. It's not. Twice in the next two chapters of 1 Samuel, as we read about the selection, the coronation of Saul as king of Israel, we're told about how tall he was, how good looking he was. Remember I talked about how horrible it would be for, uh, like to be like Eli, where your your mark on eternity, it's mentioned several times, Several times in the book of uh, 1 Samuel, how fat he was. It's a bad legacy to leave behind, not something you want to leave. Well, Saul's legacy in the beginning here was just how good looking he was, how tall he was. I heard one commentator suggest that Saul might have been a giant. I don't go for that necessarily. I think we're just getting a picture at the image of a king who is everything the Israelites could have ever wanted when they said, give us a king like all the other nations have. Outwardly, Saul was all we could look for in a leader. And we do look for something externally in leaders. We want to think we don't, but we all do it. I heard a guy once make a statement to the effect, when America sees the right of fascism or the Antichrist or whatever, our dictator won't look like some East European with a funny mustache. 
He'll look like John Wayne. We like a tough, authoritative, manly look in our leaders because we put so much stock on the externals of our leaders, even if we don't mean to. We're easy to deceive. There's a reason we seldom see short men elected to the presidency of the United States, since the onset of the media age anyway. We like tall, dark, and good hair. (laughs) At least interesting hair. Of course, this isn't just an American thing. It's a human thing. The image of strength and beauty is a, a bit relative, and it shifts from culture to culture, but people want a leader that looks good. They want one that looks strong, whatever that means in their culture. That was Saul, head and shoulders above the rest. And we read about how Samuel informed Saul he would be the king of Israel. This all happens in 1 Samuel chapters 9 and 10. Look at Saul's response. Saul replied, this is chapter 9, verse 21. Saul replied, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking like this to me? You hear it? That insecurity? The sense of inferiority? The leftover scars from the Civil War felt by the tribe of Benjamin? Saul's statement right there is not accurate. It's not true. It's not an accurate reflection of what was going on. We just read that his father was one of the richest men in the tribe. He's head and shoulders, Saul is. He's head and shoulders above the other men of his generation. He stuck out. He looked impressive. He looked significant. But inside, he's weak. He's scared. He's ultimately a fragile man. Why are you talking like this to me? That's what he says. I'm not anything special. This isn't humility here. It's not modesty. There's a difference. This is insecurity. Humility can change. It can rise up to the occasion. Insecurity bows and and breaks under the demands of God. Like an invisible disease, it has to be healed. Insecurity does. And Saul had the chance for healing. In chapter 10, as he's following through with the instructions Samuel gives him, we come across this passage of Scripture that's unlike anything we find in the Old Testament. These are the words Samuel speaks to Saul. At that time, the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. After these signs take place, do what must be done, for God is with you. That's the crux of it right there. The problem with the system of life in the Old Testament was that at their core, human beings are messed up. We can't do what we want to do even when our motives are right because of this nasty thing called sin that's resonant within us all. The new covenant, the sacrifice of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit changes all of that. That's why in the New Testament we read about being new creations, taking on the new man and and all these types of things, but that's the New Testament. In the Old Testament, in the time of Saul, it was still just try the best you can. Except right here, in this passage, in this verse, in this commissioning of Saul. And Samuel specifically says to Saul, you'll be changed into a different person. I find that really fascinating. In the time of the judges, we read of several instances in the lives of men and judges like Samson or Gideon when the Spirit of God came upon them. That's what the Bible says happens to them. The Spirit of God came upon them. And for a moment, for an important and critical time, these men of renown did great things for God. But that was just a moment. Here, Saul is changed into a different person. Later in the chapter, we read that he begins to prophesy. We're literally watching the mantle of God's authority descend upon this man. He's becoming a spiritual leader of the people. He's he's taking up the mantle that God wants the new line of kings to carry among his people. I really believe Saul was going to inherit a future of renown like what we now attribute to David. He was going to become a warrior, a poet, a king. The love for the house of God was going to fill his heart. It was going to change him. And that transformation, through that transformation, he was going to lead Israel toward the purposes of God. And we would be reading today about Jesus Christ who came from the house of Saul. That's what the future was supposed to be about. The spirit was willing. The spirit of God was. And God began to change Saul in the journey that he makes from Samuel back to his homeland. But of course, Saul doesn't inherit the destiny. He doesn't finish well. Something's left incomplete here. We get a glimpse of it in the very next chapter. At the end of Saul's journey, we find Samuel standing before the Israelites. All that has happened between him and Saul up to this point, when they're talking about Saul becoming king, that was in private. The public doesn't know about that conversation. Now comes the big day of the coronation. Samuel calls the nation together, and there had to be massive 
masses of Israelites standing before him that day. And as they stand before him, Samuel sets the tribe of Benjamin apart. He's going through this process of isolating one level of the people at a time until he unveils Saul as the new king. The tribe of Benjamin is set aside. Next, the clan within that tribe is set apart. Then the family of Kish. And finally, we come to Saul. This is your new king, Israel. One problem. Saul's not there. Samuel has to send men to search for him, but they can't find him. And God has to literally show Samuel where Saul is because Saul is hiding. He's hiding from his call. He's hiding from the prophet. He's hiding from the country, from his destiny. This man who, whose head and shoulders above the rest, who's received the transforming power of the Spirit of God, who everyone on the outside recognizes as significant and more impressive than anyone else, he's already started to retreat. He's hiding among the supplies, that, that old darkness of insecurity, of inferiority, of trembling weakness. He allowed it to dominate him again. Chapter 10, verse 24, Then Samuel said to all the people, This is the man the Lord has chosen as you, your king. No one in all Israel is like him. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. Now you got to believe when Samuel made that proclamation, there was some measure of concern in his heart. This guy? Sure, he's impressive, but there's fear in this guy. He's hiding from his own success, his own destiny. Are you sure, Lord? But Saul became king that day, flaws and all. God gave him the power to change, to, to grow, to become all he was called to be. But right here in the beginning, we find the hidden flaws already starting to show. These will pop out again later in the story. We'll get to that in the next episode. But it's worth noting that the beginning of Saul's reign... And for some time as this new king of Israel ruled the land, he was in fact very impressive. The place his strength showed up the most was militarily. Saul was a ruthless military leader. And when the army was operating right with him, he struck fear into the enemies of Israel. In fact, that's where we're going to close this episode at. Right after the coronation of Saul as king, the Ammonites, an enemy tribe of the land, they laid siege to the people of Jabesh Gilead. Remember? I told you to remember the name of that city, right? This is where the women came from who helped rebuild the tribe of Benjamin at the end of the book of Judges. So this Ammonite king lays siege to Jabesh Gilead. And the Ammonites, they're still reeling from a defeat they had suffered under one of the judges of prior generations. In the book of Judges, we read about this warlord type of judge by the name of Jephthah, who destroyed around 20 Ammonite towns in a single day. Remember, this is brutal stuff we're looking at. This is reality we're looking at. So the children of that generation, the Ammonites, are now coming to get their revenge. And they lay siege to Jabesh Gilead, a town that's really getting the worst of every situation here. The elders of Jabesh Gilead send a messenger out to the Ammonites. They say, look, can we make a treaty of some sort? Well, the king of the Ammonites says, I tell you what, if every single person in your city allows me to gouge out their right eye, I'll let you live and be my servants. Brutal stuff. Well, the people of Jabesh Gilead, they say, give us a week to decide. And while they're deciding, and for some reason, the king of the Ammonites, like kind of like the, the uh, typical bad guy in a movie, he lets them think about it for a week. And in the, while they're thinking about it, they send out, the people of Jabesh Gilead, they send out messengers to all of Israel to see if anybody will come to their aid, if anybody will come to their assistance. Now, I'm sure they're thinking no one will, right? I mean, they've, they've had a rough go of it for a couple of generations here. But when Saul hears about it, about it, this new king, as a son of the tribe of Benjamin, there's a high probability that some of his own family members lived in Jabesh Gilead. His mom was probably from there. He likely had aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents there. And in this moment, Saul rises up totally separate from his normal insecurities, We'll see that it's usually in the military facet of his rule that he felt most confident, most comfortable. He takes a bull and hacks it into 12 pieces and sends, it to all, sends those pieces to all the tribes of Israel. Now, does that sound familiar? That's the same move that the Levite with his concubine, the last chapter of Judges that we talked about. That's what he did. If you see this, when you see this, that's the message that Saul sends with this hacked up bull. If you see this, if you're outraged, it's time to fight. And the whole nation rises up behind Saul and they go to war against the Ammonites, nearly wiping them off the face of the earth. 
It says in chapter 11 of 1 Samuel that once the battle started in the morning, the Israelites slaughtered the Ammonites until the heat of the day. This is a battle that becomes a massacre that borders on the level of genocide. But at last, the people of Jabesh Gilead are safe. And for the first time in their history, the Israelites have found themselves delivered not by a judge, not by a prophet, but by a king, their king. And by the end of chapter 11, Saul, the man from the weak family of the lowest tribe of Israel, as he saw it, is sitting in front of a united nation of Israel. And that's the story of the rise of Saul. In our next episode, we're going to look at the Philistines. All right, we're going to look at the some of the origin, more of the origin of David. We're going to look at things I think you might never have noticed when you're reading through the book of 1 Samuel before. That'll be next week in part four of our series on the days of David. David.